Okay, all right, we can go ahead and get started. Um, okay. Welcome everyone to the last Region 4 Planning and Policy Council meeting of 2021, if you can believe that. <laughs> um, I'm so excited to see all of these people on the call. This is so great. Looks like we have 20 participants so far on the call, so that's wonderful. Nice. Um, just a few things before I get started. This meeting is being held virtually per the Open Meetings Act. Um, the council just decided it would be best to continue to meet virtually at this time during the pandemic just to keep everyone safe. We'll go ahead and reevaluate um, prior to each quarterly council meeting just to see where everybody's at and basically where the state and country is at and safety wise um, when we're making that decision in the future for how how we'll meet. Uh, with that being said, this meeting is being recorded and it will be posted to the department website within the next day or two. So please uh, keep your phones or your computers muted if you're not presenting or um, commenting, asking any questions. It just helps prevent any feedback from coming through. Also, if you could please state your name when you're commenting or asking a question um, as is helpful when capturing the minutes. I'm going to go ahead and uh, go through the attendance. I'm going to start with individuals um, who have joined via the computer first because I can see their name and then I'll go ahead and take the attendance of individuals who have called in. So like I said, my name is Kirby Fye. I'm here with the department. We have Avis Easley, who's also with the department. Uh, Bridget Del Baccio, did I say that correctly? <laughs> yes, you did. Okay. Hey, I'm um, with the, the health department. Welcome. Uh, Linda Brown, uh, Dia Cirillo, Dalma San Sanchez, Don, I never pronounced your last I'll name try, correctly. I'll try it at least. Okay, is it Loicano? Loicano? <laughs> No, but 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 I've heard that many times before. It's <laughs> Lee. It's Lee Ocano. Lee Ocano. You know, yep. I'm from the Philadelphia area, and a lot of these last names look really familiar, and I just cannot pronounce them anymore. <laughs> I've lived here too long. <laughs> um, Elliot Pinsley. Hold on, my my screen is one second. Elliot Pinsley. Hi, Elliot. <laughs> I pronounced yours correctly. <laughs> Hector uh, Carrasco, Trevor Henderson, Haley Hershey, Cooper or Cal Bryant, Larry Brown, Miranda K. Murphy, Natalie Metzger, Michaela Poisner, <laughs> Tyler Harrison Raby, Willie Ross, Katie Schlotman. Let me see. Sorry, my screen keeps jumping. Uh, Shara Biggs, Sharon Davis, Susan Cope, Taya Davis, Angie Thompson, Rusty Todd Emerson, Valerie Webb. Um, any uh, the two individuals? Oh, there's only one individual on the line who has called in. Can you state your name, please? Kirby, that might be me. This is Michaela Poisner. I'm on the computer, but I did use my phone and not the computer. So it, it, the number ending in 95 is this Yes. Is OK, Poisner. great. Thank yeah. you. All right, uh, we can go ahead and get started. All right, perfect. So um, we will start now with uh, reviewing the minutes um, for approval. Did everybody get a chance to look at the updated minutes that were sent this morning? All right. And Kirby or Angie, we vote on this, correct? Yes, you'll need a motion to approve and a second okay. motion. Okay, awesome. I'll make a All motion right. to approve. Is Elliot? Okay, Elliot, thank you. And do we have a second? I'll make a motion to uh, seconding it. This is Willie. Awesome, thank you, Willie. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? Aye. No. All right, so we move to approve, or we have approved the minutes. 
Thank you guys for that. Um, we will move next to the quarterly. We just have somebody. We just had somebody join. Is that right? Yes. Hello. This is Jennifer Grayson. Hey, welcome. Thank you. All right. We are just getting started out in the quarterly reports. Um, so Kirby, you want to give us the department update? Sure. Let me pull that up. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Just a few updates to go over. Lots of funding announcements. I know a lot of these were shared via email, but um, there's likely a lot of members on the call that might not be on the email list, which is a good thing to highlight. If you are on the call and you are not on the Region 4 email list um, and you would like to be, please reach out to um, Shara, Rusty, or Angie so that you can be added to the list and uh, fill out an application if needed. Year three, a um, uh, Fiscal year 2022 of the three-year plan is complete and it can be found on the department website. I've included a link to where you can access this um, in the department update, which I will send to Rusty and he copies and pastes it and puts it in the minutes so you'll have access to all of this. The August report of year two FY21 three-year plan is also completed. If you would like to take a look at that, please reach out to the regional council leadership or you can reach out to me and I will be happy to share with you. The FY 2022 mental health block grant application was submitted to SAMHSA on August 26th. The FY 22 mental health block grant report is in progress. Councils will have an opportunity to review soon. The department is expanding on track Tennessee, Tennessee's first episode psychosis initiative to three new counties. Funding for this expansion is coming from federal COVID-19 pandemic response grants. On Track Tennessee works with youth and young adults ages 15 to 30 who have experienced a first episode of psychosis. This comprehensive intervention model uses a team of mental health professionals and support services, focusing on helping people work toward recovery and meeting their personal goals. The new locations for On Track Tennessee are Montgomery County, served by Mental Health Cooperative, Anderson County served by Ridgeview Behavioral Health Services and Rutherford County served by Volunteer Behavioral Health Care Healthcare Services. These counties were selected for expansion based on a review of department mobile crisis data, which demonstrated a significant number of face-to-face -face crisis assessments for ages 10 to 24 in these counties. The department is also receiving federal funding to support the mental health needs of individuals who survived deadly flash flooding in August. More than $116,000 in funding through FEMA, through FEMA's crisis counseling program, will support services for residents of Dixon, Hickman, Houston, and Humphreys counties. The four counties were covered under a major disaster declaration following devastating flash flooding in August 2021. Mental health services will be provided through Centerstone, which has existing relationships in the affected counties and has experience doing this work following natural disasters. Funding through the grant will provide staffing for mental health professionals from Centerstone to visit the affected communities, assess needs, and deliver services. The initial funding is designed to provide services for up to 60 days. However, the department is also applying to FEMA for an additional grant, which would provide extended support to survivors for up to nine months. Um, let me see here. We have some funding. I just want to, we have lots of funding <laughs> opportunities, but I want to highlight the ones that are um, specifically in this area, in this region. OK, the department is seeking provo proposals from agencies and organizations through the state of Tennessee to develop new safe, quality and affordable permanent housing options for individuals experiencing mental illness, substance use disorders, including opioid use disorder and or co-occurring disorders. An additional focus of this funding announcement is for individuals ready for discharge from the regional mental health institutes, including those who are uninsured. The deadline to apply is November 22nd. More information can be found on the department website. This is through uh, the Creating Affordable Housing Initiative, and I've included a direct link for how you can access that. Let me see here. 
The uh, department is also requesting proposals from agencies and organizations throughout the state to develop safe, quality, and affordable permanent housing options to provide ongoing operations for newly created housing options and or to provide recovery support services to benefit residents of newly developed safe, quality, and affordable permanent housing for Tennessee's, Tennesseans living with substance use disorder. The deadline to apply is also November 22nd, and I have included um, a direct link. This is through um, the CHI 2.0. And last but not least, the department is seeking proposals from local providers interested in implementing the Tennessee Resiliency Project Grant in targeted communities. The department will provide funding to the seven uh, regional planning and policy council regions of the state to cultivate partnerships, assess communities' needs, and provide community-based, family-driven, evidence-based services and supports that align with the three Tennessee Resiliency Project project grant goals. Those three goals are to promote early childhood mental health, which would be providing social and emotional learning with a focus on children ages zero through eight, increase access to school-based mental health services, which would create linkages and services that ensure K through 12 students receive a multi-tiered system of support, and ensure enhanced coordination of crisis care. This would position behavioral health professionals in child serving environments to assist with screening, the coordination provision of mental health crisis support, and to provide enhanced follow-up service, which has proven to reduce suicidal ideation attempts and other mental health crises. The deadline to apply for this grant is November 15th, and I've also included another link um, in my department update. And that is what I have. Lots of, lots of funding opportunities right now. Yes, thank you, Kirby. Um, and then do we have anybody from the MCOs to provide an update? Did you say MCOs? Yeah, the yes, the 10 care MCOs. Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm with United Healthcare Community Plan. Hi, yes. everybody. Uh, I don't have anything to uh, update. I just want to remind all of you that we are still here and we are supporting the community um, in any uh, of, of your efforts to, um, you know, for health fairs and conferences and anything you need in your agency, please approach me. We do still go carry on with our sponsorships. Awesome. Thank you so much. Is anyone from Amerigroup or Blue Cross Blue Shield on the phone or on the call? For me, this was a fairly easy thing to do. Uh, I still uh, touch base with my kids who run my business, and I was there for 37 years. And uh, the number of entities, uh, NFIB, it drags in 93,000. Is that television? Is that a television? I can't tell. <laughs> and, uh, I'm, is is there anybody from um, the other MCOs, Amir Group, or Blue Care on the on the meeting with a report? Up to five hundred. Going once, going twice. All right, we are going to move on then. Um, we're going to move on to the committee reports, and so we'll start with the children's committee. Uh, Susan or Maria. I know Susan's on. I'm not sure if Maria is. Um, but do you have an update for us today? Yes, uh, Maria had another meeting she had to attend and she was unable to be with me. Um, Maria and I uh, co-sponsored the reorganizational meeting for the um, Children and Youth Subcommittee uh, on October the 26th. Um, we had uh, 12 attendees, um, and we are pleased to, to have those people join us, and we encourage other people to join this subcommittee if you are dealing with children's issues. Um, Maria encouraged everyone to uh, turn in their application forms, and then um, we were very thankful to uh, have uh, Shara there with us, uh, who talked about the operational guidelines and the timetables for the needs assessments. 
we did some brief discussions of needs that people are seeing with uh, children and families in the Davis County area. And uh, some of those were the school-based support services, uh, education for families on how to reduce their stress as they uh, parent their children. Homelessness is an issue and of course suicide. Uh, Maria and I serve multiple counties, so we requested from those in attendance uh, if anyone was interested in serving as care, uh, chair or co-chair of this uh, subcommittee to please let Maria know. Um, I think we've had um, some people that have contacted her and we're grateful for that. Uh, this subcommittee will meet again on January the 25th. Uh, 2022. And that's our report. Thank you all. Thank you, Susan. Um, I need to. I did something to make the screen really small. Like, give me a second to. Can't get it back to full size. There we go. Um, all right. So next is our adult committee update. Um, Evelyn is out this week, so I'm going to just provide um, a quick update. We did meet as a um, full committee on October 21st um, to start the discussion on um, how we wanted to prepare for the needs assessment. Um, it, we have determined to kind of divide our subcommittee into two groups, one to focus on the mental health I mean, yeah, the mental health needs and want to focus on the substance use needs. Um, and so since that meeting on the 21st, uh, each group has met and delved into the priorities that um, we are wanting to identify. Um, we have, so Evelyn is leading the adult, the mental health group, and then Bridget is taking the lead on the substance use group. Um, let's see. So as of now, each group has um, listed their priorities and compared these to the three-year plan to see what is already in the plan that matches up to priorities that we listed so that we're not um, like duplicating efforts with that. Uh, I believe that Angie, does that sound like it wraps it up pretty well? Yeah, I think the, the key of that is that the meetings that were held by each of the subgroups um, were held in a consensus workshop format. So yes. we wanted to get information or input from everyone in the meeting and then uh, we looked at whether or not those things were um, there were, whether there were items that would need to be addressed at the local level or at the state level. So we did some um, evaluation of that. And then once those ideas were all um, um, created, then the, the chairs went back and looked at, as Shara said, were these things already in the strategic plan? Uh, there was some overlap from the information from the substance from the uh, mental health group that overlapped with substance use, uh, and that information was provided to the substance use uh, subgroup when they met. Um, so I think we're at a, a really good point in terms of uh, the primary function of the regional council being uh, in needs assessment and organizing the adult group uh, to really provide. Um, some good recommendations to the department. Thank you. Thank you. Bridget, did you have anything that you wanted to add? Uh, did we lose her? Were you talking to me? Are you Bridget? <laughs> no. <laughs> I was like, did you say Kirby? My computer keeps jumping in and out. I'm like, um. <laughs> yeah, no, I was wanted to see if Bridget had anything she wanted to add. And your format keeps, I don't know what I'm doing, but it's changing. So I'm trying to see if she's still on. Um, but I'm going to. 
Oh, yeah, it looks like she's here. Bridget, if you're trying to talk, you're muted. She may have just stepped away. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Well, we can move on. Um, as of now, the adult committee does not have um, a meeting scheduled, but we are working on that um, and having a, um, we need to decide a frequency of meetings and when these meetings will be held. And so once that is decided, that information will be sent out to the council so that if we have any um, uh, additional council members who want to join in the adult committee, they'll have that information. Um, and I do want to also say with that, um, for anyone who's on the meeting today, if you're not already part of one of the subcommittees, either the children's, the adult, or the legislative, um, please reach out if you're interested and we will get you connected. All right, uh, next we've got the legislative committee update with Elliot. Hi everybody, um, I'm Elliot Pinsley uh, from the Behavioral Health Foundation and uh, chair of the Region 4 Legislative Committee. And uh, I, I think it would be, um, I would be remiss if I didn't start by um, saying thank you to um, Commissioner Williams and all of her staff at the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services for what um, I have interpreted as a historic um, budget um, proposal that they have put forward um to the governor lee they had on monday um, budget hearings began uh these are preliminary these are where departments present um their planned cost increases for the coming year as well as any reductions um this year there was a call for a one percent efficiency or reductions plan so all departments are asked to um, look at that uh, so the department of mental health um to put in perspective i'll just start here last year um, the department asked for seven million dollars in new funding um for their for next year for this current year's budget uh, on monday commissioner williams asked for 107 million dollars in new funding um and uh and the governor and the folks there with the governor didn't blink so uh it was really good news um of course this is not final this is provisional and we have to wait for the uh legislature to approve this funding um coming in the spring so but this is this is incredible there's uh uh, a well overdue um, pot for cost of living adjustments or, or provider rate increases. Um, this was $36 million approximately. And th the way the department calculated this by looking at the past 10 years saying we're way behind 2% per year, 20%, there you go. So this is just catching up to speed. Um, and uh, this, this came out of efforts from our council, from our group. We put forward legislative proposals the last couple of years on workforce shortage issues. Uh, we worked with Region 2 on another proposal and and also included that in our needs assessment. And uh, all of these combined efforts from across organizations and um, regions helped um, to elevate this issue over the summer. A uh, workforce development work group met, um, co-led by TenCare and the Department of Mental Health. Uh, and that's where a lot of this is coming from. So we're waiting on a final report from that group, but um, I am I, I could say for sure that these uh, cost of living adjustments uh, came out of that. And so did another pot of $10 million for um, workforce development. And I'm scrolling down to make sure I can tell you what that includes um, here in a moment, uh, but it comes with uh, sign on bonuses for clinician. That's $4 million worth a scholarship program, which is $5 million. Um, and a new internship portal that they're developing to help facilitate internships among um, institutions and providers, community mental health centers, et cetera. So uh, a lot of um, building and planning of things that are quite frankly, just we need to catch up with what the medical um, side, fiscal health side of the field is doing to incentivize folks at a time where a lot of people are leaving um, their, their positions. So this is really excellent news. Um, the other things I wanted to mention here, there was a lot of money um, for the substance use um, related continuum of services. There's six million dollars for, um, well I'll just wrap it all up. We've got seven million dollars in different clinical and addiction recovery and wraparound programs and then we have at long asked for beds um, in our needs assessment from this region I know um, for substance use treatment and there was 26 and a half million dollars one-time funding to develop uh, I believe it was 200 to 300 new residential addiction treatment beds. So again, just trying to, this is, I see this as incredibly responsive to the needs um, that we have done more so than I have seen previously. And 
Um, it is a it, just a great sign that mental health and uh, addiction recovery is being prioritized by our state. Um, I've shared with the region a, an overview so you can get more information. There's also IPS supportive employment that was expanded. We've got um, the crisis continuum expansion is also big. I forgot to mention that that's almost $26 million in funding. Um, a little over 10 of that is recurring funding, and uh, that is going to fund um, three more uh, crisis stabilization units and walk-in centers. Um, it's not uh, clear yet exactly which those centers are, but some have been added through new pre-arrest diversion um, infrastructure funding over the past couple of years and plans for some more. So this is all good, good stuff that um, the commissioner has um, just feel like we should all, you know, be thankful and applaud because again, I've never, never seen this level of cost increases included um, in a proposal. So I initially thought 10 care did the same thing, um, but frankly, they did not um, follow suit from the department. Um, there was a $50 million um, workforce development line item in the department or in 10 cares uh, budget proposal, but um, that was for long term services and support. So that's needed as well, but that's more on the intellectual and developmental disability side of things. And uh, there were $7 million um, in uh, rate increases for community mental health centers in the 10 care budget and another 4 million or so related to um, Tennessee Health Link uh, and uh, intensive in home treatment um, that is counteracted just a bit by uh, the there was, I believe, five million dollars that was proposed as a reduction um, related to some savings. They think they can recoup through something related to Tennessee Health Link and um, intensive in home treatment. So there's a lot of things that need to be ironed out there. Um, one, the one thing that we do want to say um, for the I'm not sure how many years it's been, but peer support centers are again on the chopping block, according to, you know, the um, efficiency plan from the Department of Mental Health. I know they had to put something there. Um, but uh, these are vital services with, you know, research really backing the need for more peer support. So we, we really can't afford to scale back there. So I, I'm hopeful that that will not uh, have to be um, removed from the budget for next year, but wanted to let everybody know about that. So lots of different areas to get involved in terms of advocacy. Um, quickly, uh, I got an update, which not much of an update, but just earlier this week, I talked to uh, Kurt Hippel from the department about our Fentanyl Overdose Prevention Act the legislative proposal that will decriminalize fentanyl test strips if it passes. Um, it's, I was told no news yet from the governor's office, but that no news in these situations is often good news. So uh, again, I'm optimistic, but uh, we can't um, count anything yet. And uh, we're hoping to hear. So we expect to hear back in early January um, regarding whether the governor will carry that in his legislative agenda or not. And I've uh, been dis in discussions with folks about what to do if that doesn't happen, because this is certainly much needed. Um, there were a couple of special sessions you may have seen in the news for the legislature that they're not back, but they, they came to talk about the Ford deal and then they came to talk about COVID. We won't go into those details because I don't have much nice to say, uh, but um, I, I, a lot happened and, uh, and hopefully, and, and we've got great folks in Davidson County and Region 4 that are taking care of our needs and helping keep us safe in pandemic. Um, and so hopefully they're able to continue doing so and have the authority. So uh, the in January is when we start to see the legislature return for the normal session. So that's when we're going to start to see um, everybody convening. And then early February is where bills really are are filed in, in big numbers. So that's where we're going to see a lot more. Um, I also wanted to mention related to COVID for anybody who didn't see the news, um, COVID-19 vaccines through Pfizer, the biotech are available now to ages five and up. So the CDC unanimously approved um, those vaccines for ages five to 11 yesterday. It was very strong statement. They moved quickly as quickly as they could um, in terms of the approval in the last week. And so I just my kids are both in that uh, window of ages. So I can tell you, I know that CVS and Walgreens are scheduling appointments. So if anybody else is serving young kids, has young kids, knows young kids, and or in parents of young kids, I should say, um, that I know they're scheduling. So I could get an appointment for Sunday. Um, I, pediatricians offices should be getting them. I can just tell you I called ours and they're a little bit behind the curve here. So uh, most retail pharmacies should have them. And uh, they're the two shot resume, just like ours, about a third of the dose. So. Um, uh, there's a lot more other things going on with Nashville planning. We had uh, a great team that attended um, from Nashville the taking the call conference related to um, community responder models um, and the Nashville Heals proposal. And uh, and I was pleased that Angie Thompson, you know, fellow member of our committee here, our council, joined us on that team as a, 
uh, an addition and we were very grateful for her participation and we're continuing with a couple more team meetings uh, before we know kind of where we're going in terms of planning for that. And just lastly, quick update on co-response, the Partners in Care program. The latest data I have to share from um, Inspector David Imhoff is um, that they're in the first four months, they had received 570 calls for service. Um, this is where, by the way, the Mental Health Cooperative is going out with uh, Metro Nashville Police together to respond to certain calls. Um, out of those 570 calls, only 3.7% of those calls resulted in arrest and force was used in 1.4% of calls. So while I don't have baselines to really compare to, that's the number that we have so far. Um, and we're looking forward. I know um, Angie and others at the Metro Public Health Department are working on um, this data evaluation and there'll be some richer reporting to come as we get to six months and beyond. So um, ex reason to be excited there. And uh, the next region four planning, or excuse me, the legislative committee meeting is on December 2nd at 2 p.m. It's virtual. If you want to be there, even if you have no idea about policy, you don't have a clue about writing anything or what we're talking about, but you want to learn, you have ideas, anybody is welcome. Please reach out to me. I'll drop my uh, contact information in the chat in a moment. So thank you. Ellie, can I ask one question? Absolutely. How is the what was the number of beds that they're looking to add again for substance utilization? 200 to 300 residential beds. Thank you. I apologize for my errors in this last thing. Uh, I really appreciate your dedication to legislative work. I know how uh, how difficult it is. Oh, you are you do a wonderful job, Rusty, and I appreciate you. And I talk so fast, I, I don't expect many to keep up. So um, <laughs> I, I'm happy to to help. And uh, I will put both. I'll put that link to the uh, that has more details about the budget and the actual document um, in the chat as well. So you'll see that momentarily. All right. Thank you, sir. Awesome. Thank you, Elliot. There's such great updates. Um, very excited about the budget proposal. Um, we've got some some really good things uh, happening in the state for sure. Um, so just continue to keep us posted on that. And um, I I don't remember. I will ch try to check, but I can't remember if I forwarded the budget presentation slides to everybody. Um, but I can, I will do that because I don't remember quite doing it. Um, but it's, it's good information to see, um, not only, you know, what's being proposed, but the, um, just the data that's included, uh, that what was included. In the, I'm sorry. I think you have, I'm going to double okay. checking. <laughs> oh, and it was, Elliot, did you put it in the chat? I did. I just dropped a link to the, the department slides um, from okay. Monday in the chat. I'm about to drop 10 cares as well. And I'll also put a link for all of the budget hearings. So if anybody wants to see any of the other documents that have been presented or are coming up, um, you can have access to that because all the departments are doing that this week. Awesome. Thank and you. And Shara, you did send it. I just went back to the emails. You sent it. You're on top of things. <laughs> Thank you. I, I got I went into autopilot mode yesterday. So. <laughs> You have done an excellent job. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so um, next on the agenda is the needs assessment discussion. Um, and so this is my first time going through this full process. Um, so I am leaning on the more seasoned council members to help um, with this, but I feel like there's been some good progress made um, after attending the adult and the children's committees committee meetings. Um, hey, uh, Shara? Yes. Can I, um, it's Kirby. Can I hop hey. in here just really quick just to talk Absolutely. about an update yes. for the needs assessment? Okay. Um, so um, as you all know, well, maybe not all of you know, um, as some of you may know, um, and some of you, this might be the first time hearing about the needs assessment. Um, every year, the department, um, asks all seven regional planning and policy councils, um, along with the consumer advisory board, the statewide adult committee and the statewide children's committee to participate in um, a needs assessment. Uh, during that time, each of those councils and committees uh, will identify two mental health needs and two substance abuse needs from their region um, or you know, throughout the state. 
um, to submit uh, to be included in the needs assessment summary, which I put together, and then the department receives it and reviews it and incorporates it into their three year plan. Excuse me. Well, um, this past legislative proposal season, we had um, a legislative proposal from Region 2 that requested that we increase the number of needs that are allowed to be submitted um, each year. Well, Commissioner Williams took a look at that. It wasn't something that needed to be addressed through legislation. It was something that could be addressed in-house. And uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Williams took a look at that and decided that she would allow each regional council and statewide committee to submit anywhere from two to six okay. needs for their region or um, statewide, their, their committee. So the only requirement is that if you're going to submit two needs, um, one must be mental health, they must be equal um, representation. So if you're going to submit two needs, one must be mental health, one must be substance abuse. Hold on one second, I'm getting some feedback here. Um, okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so anywhere from two to six needs, uh, so two, four, six, um, the data piece is still required to be a part of it. I know that that's typically um, the hardest part for each regional council and the committees to work on. Um, so we have a statewide planning and policy council meeting in December that's open to the public. It's going to be held virtually again um, this year. It's December 14th at 10 a.m. And Elena Amahandro, who is our director for the Office of Research, her and her team are putting together a presentation that, <coughs> excuse me, that will identify new resources um, for everyone to have access to. Um, she she's developing this based on feedback that she received from the regional councils on what would be most beneficial for them when uh, putting together these needs assessment summaries. Um, it, it's going to have things even there for COVID-19 as well, data as it pertains to that. Um, but as you know, you don't need to use that data uh, to support your need. It could be data from the agency you work for. It could be data from SAMHSA. It could be data from wherever. Whatever is the best data that supports your need. Um, but she just wanted to do this to make it more helpful for everyone as they move forward in the needs assessment process. So it's a good update, I think. <laughs> Um, because you know it's hard to narrow down four needs. It's going to be hard even to narrow down six needs, I'm sure. Um, but it's a little bit better. So Kirby, I appreciate that. Can I ask a quick question just to make sure I'm following? Um, mm -hmm. I so this is not up to twelve total needs, six mental health subs and six substitutes. No. Up to three each. So basically, you can either do one need for each. You can do two needs for each, or three. You can take Correct. your. Okay, great. Thank you for the clarification. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Hopefully that gave a little background to Shara <laughs> on the needs assessment process. Um, yes, I know everyone. I know this is your first go around with it, um, but for sure, Angie and Elliot and um, several other council members too have all been through this process several years in a row now, and I'm always here to help as well and to give any guidance I can. Yes, thank you. Um, I do have a question. I feel like I should either have already asked this question or should know this question. But when we are talking about um, the need, the total needs, so we've got mental health side and substance abuse side, are we combining adult and children, and children for each side? So like if we have, if we go three and three, do the, are those three a combination of the adult and children needs? Uh -huh. It's whatever right? your regional council um, decides is a need. Some regional councils, they always dedicate at least one to children and one to adult. It just really depends. Um, okay. But some regional councils, it's, it also depends on how you uh, work to put them together. Region 4 has an established adult and children's committee and, excuse me, and legislative committee. Not every regional council has that opportunity to have those developed committees running due to you know, changes in jobs and availability of members. Um, 
So there are some regional councils that they work together just as one giant group to put mm -hmm. together um, their needs assessments. So sometimes it's all adult, sometimes it's all children. It really just depends on what the needs are um, in your regional council, in your region. Okay. And Cheryl, I'll, I'll share quickly that typically in Region 4, um, and since I've been involved, our, we have developed them as a broader group. We haven't held space for any one type, but we do try to make sure all the voices are accounted for. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, with this change in policy, we get a little bit more um, wiggle room, which is good. Um, mm -hmm. So where we have active children's and adult committees and they're able to look at the needs in advance of our meetings and report back, we I think what we've done mostly is Tell us what you think from your committee for your you know, focus area is most important. And then we kind of overall have weighed that um, as a region and figure out what we want. And then the other um, thing that has been done is the statewide children's committee and the statewide adult committees. There is an opportunity for our region for children's committee or the uh, adult committee to work through those statewide committees to help elevate certain needs since they are also looking at needs, if I'm not mistaken. But Kirby can correct me if I'm wrong there. Yeah, and this is Robin, if I might comment. Yeah, um, and sorry for having, sorry to have to come in late uh, today, guys. Um, yeah, so I think what we're, I think what we're seeing, which is really excellent, is um, a rebuilding and a resurgence of our adult committees and our children's committees um, with people being able to come forward now. And I think we're going to be able to robustly uh, be able to present uh, needs for the needs assessment with our subcommittees in addition to our um, to to the full council, and I think that's going to be excellent. I love Elliot's suggestion, and and Elliot and um, Elliot and, I and and Angie worked last year. One of the things that we did was understand that when when we are go beyond just region four, when we look at other regional councils and some of the needs that we all see as important, that it does, it is worthwhile for us to maybe look at a state council or look at other regional councils um, to uh, assess needs that are important to all of us and have those rise to the top. And I think we definitely saw success with that with the um, the workforce um, legislation and, um, and, and the, and the uh, recommendations there. So, um, and the only thing I would say is I appreciate the fact that we can do more than two for each of the um, the committees and for the council as a whole. Uh, just let's not get too too many things too too mired. You know, lots of let's not let's make sure we have some focus that we're really going to put some teeth behind. Um, and um, even though we know there's a lot of issues out there, so that's my two cents. Also, yeah. so this is Avis. Just keep in mind as well as 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 the council on the local level, mm -hmm. uh, in addition to the statewide children's committee and adult committee as well. If you are sending a representative or you have a representative on that call, just be mindful if those are the the uh, needs that you are working on in your regional council as well. Be careful. On, on a sense that you don't want to have those same ones show up in the children's committee you you may want to separate and i'm saying that because if you say for instance you have two or three uh needs on the children's side you you may have that point person that sits on that statewide committee to suggest su suggest one for the statewide across the state but as your local level you would want to keep that need on that region four that way you may be able to you know get more than one or two in because you are adding adding some on the statewide level so keep that in mind you don't want to duplicate it mm -hmm. um just be careful with that as you're working you don't want to do du duplicate information is what i'm saying yeah okay the, i i appreciate that avis the only thing i will share is that um the budget committee unless and is looking at trends across regions so I, I think it is important at least across regions that trends emerge and my understanding is that we're if we have a legislative proposal for example that we would like to put forward um, our chances of that being considered um, for forwarding on to the governor can greatly improve if it's backed up by the needs assessment meaning that a lot of regions have said this is a priority for them so they're looking for those things to match 
So um, yes, I, I know Avis has a lot more knowledge about than I do about the different statewide um, groups and committees that meet. But in terms of the different regions, I just wanted to clarify that it is actually good to have trends across regions if we want something to stand out um, for future action. Right, and Elliot, that is correct. For the regions across the board, yes. Just really speaking of duplication on the statewide committee level. So yes, that helps and has helped in the past. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm gonna do, we had the, so I know the adult committee did a, a lot of intense work over the last couple of months. Um, for the children's committee, I, I want to pull up, oh, now I have to find where I, where I pulled everything. Um, let me see, pull up the list that we looked at um, of the priority last year. And, oh my goodness, there's just so many documents. <laughs> let me just go to the email. Okay, um, so if it's okay, I'm gonna fumble through sharing my screen. Uh, and then try to make this a little, oh, there it is, a little bit bigger. Okay, can you guys see this list? Not yet. Not, oh, not yet, Shara. Yeah. I probably missed a step. I missed a step. Hold on. <laughs> now, 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 can you see the list? Um, Looks like it's trying to come. Oh, there yeah. it is. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, this is the list from last year. And what we did in the adult committee is we went through and, and, looked at what priorities are we still wanting to identify for this year. Um, and so that's what's in blue. The yellow are the priorities that we would defer to the Children's Committee to see if, if as a subcommittee, if you guys still want to prioritize that. Um, this here in the nice magenta, pinkish, purplish color, um, was in addition to one that we had last year. The green is one that we know is already being worked on. And then we slash through um, topics that we felt like either fit somewhere else or we were not as concerned with prioritizing this year. So this is the mental health side. Here's the substance abuse side. Um, and so I, I need some feedback um, from the children's side of what what do we want to prioritize? Um, we need to, I feel like we need to have some discussion around that on the children's needs. And can we talk broadly about just broad needs as well? Sure, yes. Do you want to start with one or the other mental health or substance use? Uh -oh. maybe? Let's let's start with substance abuse, just since it's on the left and that's the direction we read. So we'll start with that. Shara, can you also put up the work that this year's this is from the past year and then this year's group has also done some work. So just so people understand that when the mental health group met, the three that are in blue on the left hand side of your screen, those were things that the mental health group prioritized to send to the uh, to the substance use uh, yes. subcommittee. And then the substance use subcommittee has another document as well. So uh, just to prioritize, just to clarify that for everybody. Yeah, that I actually have. So that is here. I don't know how to do multiple screens, guys. So. Um, some of you already know that I'm very limited when it comes to this virtual meeting setup. Um, there it is. 
Yeah, so you can see, so here's the, the substance abuse needs list. Um, and then we have, <laughs> let me see. I know there's a way to do this. Just give me just a second. Um, oh, Y'all, please ignore my bazillion emails. Okay, if I can. Oh, is it going to let me? Okay. I feel like we need somebody like telling jokes or something right now. <laughs> Everybody's so quiet. Okay. Okay, this is at least for right now, we've got it. Um, so this here is the list of um, priorities from the mental health side. And then um, this is the list from the substance use side. So from the adult committee perspective, this is kind of what we have focused on. Um, let's look first at substance use needs from adult and children's perspectives and have a discussion about that um, because these are all going to be adults. So whoever would like to start the discussion, please do. I can't see anybody. So um, I can't on anyone right now. I can start while others are thinking. Uh, I think um, we have a great need um, in Region 4 and across our state for um, potentially for funding for um, a substance use related deflection um, program or maybe multiple types of deflection. But um, one um, idea would be to um, allow law enforcement once they get comfortable with co-response and others to add elements where we can, when we have folks we know with known addiction issues, we can help try to keep them from going into jail and instead um, help them get back into treatment. So there are, uh, this would be for substance use uh, deflection, essentially. <laughs> and I, I do know that there's some things being considered for our city, but there's nothing concrete yet. Okay. So, and I'm making notes. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, my, my name is Francis Garcia. I'm the Hispanic Community Engagement uh, Coordinator for the Office of Minority Health. Uh, and I just want to contribute um, to the conversation. I'm doing the strategic planning for testing and then subsequently vaccinating. One of the things that we've been able to do translated uh, information regarding some of the services that we have around um, So I want to, that's my contribution to this, whether it's treatment or adults, especially talking about substance abuse. Um, we want to ensure that that community is receiving those services. That we're tailoring that information and their language. Okay. Is is there a particular that's great. Is there a particular need in terms of like do we need documents in a certain like that need to be translated? Do we need um folks who speak um are native Spanish speakers or um other languages? I mean, what are do you have any more specifics yeah. on the needs? I was gonna ask the same thing. The tangibles would be that uh, that can do that outreach and that engagement in that particular language. We know that the Hispanic population is the, our largest minority across the state. Uh, each county, uh, since I began this work over eight years ago, um, has increased between 1.5 to well over 7.0 percent. And that goes from metro to rural as well. So we, we've done a lot of partnerships and workshops around different health disparities, including substance abuse. Um, and that's the one thing that I always find myself 
having to pull from other states um, information. So for example, Florida, California, uh, Washington, DC, New York, um, just to find information that we can then tailor to that population. This is Robin. I'm so going to say that it has to be twofold staff as well as translated information regarding the services that we offer across the state. And this is Robin. I will dovetail onto that even for um, for Davidson County and Region 4. Yeah. And, um, you know, definitely um, seeing a need. We, we know that there are some resources available. Um, I have also had to go outside the state to my NAMI counterparts and in, in other states, say for uh, for information. And this is on the mental health side for um, the Haitian community. Um, I was able to reach out to my counterpart in Miami for um, things in French that were already developed. Um, we are currently at last night, actually, we are currently working with the um, Chinese American um, Association and with API of Middle Tennessee um, to create a survey for mental health needs in, um, in those communities. And we are also working with the um, you know, the Muslim community we're just beginning to work with, but I totally agree we've had, um, and, and there is LEP language, um, you know, proficiency that um, agencies that are funded by the state are required to meet. You need to be able to, if you are somebody that is serving diverse communities, then you need to be able to respond in, um, in languages to them. And the other thing you need to look at is, are you speaking colloquial Spanish or are you speaking formal Spanish? Are you right. speaking Spanish that the people that are receiving the services, you know, need and understand? And so um, we do have some folks um, in Region 4 that do respond, and that is, you know, Family and Children Services is a go-to. Um, the... Um, Catholic Social Services does a lot of um, uh, immigrants. There are there are some others, but I would agree that it it you know if if we need those things, um, teaching people how to reach out for what they need when they don't speak the language and don't know how to you know get to those folks to to ask for things in their language. And uh, uh, Robin, this is Kubra here. It's not just the language; it's the culture as well. How to approach and what's exactly. you know, appropriate, what isn't appropriate. You know. That's what we did. We're doing a survey in the um, uh, a API community that never mentions the words mental health because it's we were advised not to do that. We only are using the word stress or stress management with the survey that we're doing for assessment. Hello, this is Dalmis Sanchez. I will, I'm with Disability Rights Tennessee and I want to ditto all of that. Um, that was said about the need for um, linguistic competence, and yes, let's include culturally cultural competence as well. And I want to say that in the all this uh, funding that we have that have been approved through the state, I would I hope that some of it is uh, used for um, incentives to the. Spanish-speaking population to actually go into the fields of mental health uh, to become professionals because it is so important that the Spanish-speaking population has professionals to go to that speak their language. It's very different uh, to have services with an interpreter than it is without an interpreter, and there is a lot of data to support that. Uh, but at least have, having an interpreter is actually um, indispensable. You have to have interpreters for these things. So anyways, I just wanted to support that and um, and say that is so important. And if it is in the needs assessment, that would be wonderful. I, I also want to second all of that. That is really very important. I can, I, for those who may not have seen a, it was uh, earlier in the year, the statewide council, there was a discussion on workforce development with, with Commissioner Williams and an opportunity for everybody to provide feedback. And there were several people who, um, whether it was the Hispanic community or uh, Black and African American community or others, you know, just about this, making sure we have people who look and sound like the people that they're treating. Um, and there was there was a lot of emphasis put on that. Uh, we are awaiting a final um, version to be um, 
put out to the public from this workforce development work group that 10 care and the department of mental health put forward we know the funding amounts they've given but we don't have those details so i think we'll have a better idea by our february meeting if they included anything specific or have plans to address this and if if it's not extremely clear or even if it is we may want to reinforce it here so i think it's a great idea and this is robin i want to add one more thing let's remember that american sign language is a language and um, and the deaf community is very very isolated, um, often because of um, you know that situation. So we need to we 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 recently here at Nami Davidson had had something brought to us um, because of that. So um, so let's make sure when we're being language inclusive that we're being inclusive of the of the deaf community also. And you're right. And I would say to Commissioner Williams and team's credit, they have added at least one new position within the department in this past year, specifically focused on um, inclusion and, and helping folks with um, hearing and other issues. So um, I, I, I think that is at least in the process of being addressed and hopefully um, some of those needs will be resolved. So I, I'm very pleased to see the responsiveness after um, some folks reached out to the department, but uh, we need to make sure that it is, of course, working. Thank you, Ellen. Yeah, it definitely will be really helpful uh, to, to be inclusive of, of those populations, even in, in the workforce that we have across the street. And I respect the health departments in the rural counties. Um, you know, I've traveled well over to, I would like to say over 65 counties total since I started this work. Uh, and populations have begun to emerge. Um, we need to make sure that Department of Health is a reflection of those populations within those respective counties. Um, the speaker sound has stopped working. We lost you on the sound. That happens with teams in a weak connection sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Can you state what you the last sentence, couple of sentences you made? Because we lost you on the on the sound connection there. Sorry about that. Can you guys hear that? Uh -oh. Got a little feedback. Um, the last couple it, of sentences. It, oh, just regarding you know um, the the health disparities educational piece. Um, you know, traveling across the state and just looking at the makeup of these different communities, um, ensuring that we also um, as the Tennessee Department of Health have a reflection and outreach piece that focus on that, meaning let's create more opportunities to hire more diversity within central office and the other health departments across the state. That would be really helpful. One of the things that COVID-19 uh, has identified is that we have an opportunity right now to, to make sure that we're able to develop and maximize those opportunities and build capacity around those needs. Um, you know, we had to really pivot on the dime when we were going outreach to those respective counties that had the highest um, uh, transmittal rates, that had the highest infection rates, and, and we immediately were able to, to recognize the fact that we just didn't have enough staff that was able to do the particular work or had enough materials to educate as well as test and vaccinate. Um, so we, we really immediately had to pivot on the dime uh, in order to be able to do that. And we continue to do so. So this is, I, I love what I'm hearing um, because this is definitely um, something that has not really been discussed when we've talked about um, the needs, you know, just this current needs assessment report. So how do we want, how would we want to add this? How do we want to identify? Because I'm hearing um, having the services available, um, having the materials available, um, hiring on the, on the workforce side, you know, seeking out and hiring, um, uh more diverse individuals to be able to serve the population um but we do if 
if we're wanting to include this, um, we need to kind of narrow it down, like what would we like to focus on um, in regards to this? Shara, this is Robin. I think it's two part. I think one part is in workforce development and incentivizing. Um, you know, we want to, we need to let people um, uh, and of um, uh, different cultures, different languages. And, and when I talk about cultures, I'm also including the LGBTQ. Right. Um, and so when, um, when we're incentivizing folks to go into those fields that we, um, you know, specifically uh, earmark um, some folks, some monies that will, um, you know, incentivize folks from those areas um, that we're that we're looking at in those multicultural areas. So I think that would be one way to look at it is to make sure that um, workforce incentives. And I'll state this again about workforce incentives that I don't think they should just be for those that are at the top of the chain. Um, that we need techs as much as we need nurses mm -hmm. um, and and people at entry level positions. So. Um, so incentivize um, uh, multicultural entry into, um, you know, for education and then um, the incentives for uh, payment and service in our um, regional institutes and um, other um, and community uh, public health and public mental health facilities. Um, and then I think the other the other part is um, you know, we do in in many in many ways. This is this is covered. If if you are not offering you know services in a way that is um, language um, proficiency, then you're if you are receiving state funding, you're not in line with your you're not aligned with your state funding. And so uh, let's just make sure that we're we're um, following up with that. You know, some of this stuff is in place, and and we need to. Uh, just make sure that um, I, I know it's being monitored because mm -hmm. I, I know uh, Gwen Hamer is the one who's in charge of the Title VI survey. And those of you that are get state funding, you know you have to complete that. So, um, you know, so I, I think some of that is, is spoken for. Yeah, I, I think you're right. But I think that a lot of the way that it's spoken for is by utilization of translation services and language lines. Mm -hmm. um, so we're still lacking individuals who can just sit down and have a conversation with someone without having that third party, even though I know that third party is supposed to be completely neutral and all of that. I mean, as somebody who's provided, had to provide a service with an interpreter in the room, it is a, a very different experience. Um, I, I Absolutely. Have a but do we, uh, that's why I'm mentioning workforce because I'm yeah. not sure we have people at the ready to come in and do that. I have a quick question. I just was, I think that I don't want to lose sight of what Francis said about the engagement and the outreach piece. And I wanted to ask for anybody who may know, do we in Davidson County have any recovery um, navigators or lifeliners, um, for example, who are, um, are, are from the Hispanic community um, or to engage with that group? Does anybody know if we have any? I'm, I'm not aware right off of any. Okay, so that would be a really easy place to look for data. Yeah, Elliot, I, I've tried um, just with the different components that we do, have done workshops around, and I have not been able to locate one specific to this abuse. Okay, so there's a couple programs that they offer we could potentially ask for, you know, to add somebody and prioritize that. So I think really good, and uh, I'd say, Shara, how about if we maybe just a suggestion? I, I we don't have to decide anything today, but lay right. out some of these main items that the group likes and we mm -hmm. can review them and we can wait for that workforce report to come out hopefully and then decide where we need to go. But I, I do, I think it was maybe one, the way I saw it was like Robin, a couple of workforce was one incentivizing, um, you know, people, uh, the right people for the right uh, folks who need care. And then the other is the outreach piece, but also the making sure we have um, the right materials and the right languages and equal access to that. Mm -hmm. So like outreach and education? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that, that sounds awesome. Elliot, if possible, I, if, if you have some time in the next few weeks, I would love to schedule some time just to chat with you a little bit more about um, those opportunities. Sure, let's talk offline. I'll, I'll share my email again. Thanks. 
Um, and then as we're talking about this too, I just want to kind of toss out, and I guess this is also sort of a, oh, I guess this comes in a question statement form. So when we're looking at identifying our, our needs and we're, this topic, I feel like applies to adults and children. So would we, would we have to separate that out? I mean, this could just be, as we have talked about it in kind of the key components, that would cover both populations, right? We don't have to separate it out. There's no we reason. To, we so we can have it just as, as we have talked about it, like that would be appropriate. Sharon, you could do this as a full council ask. Okay. Gotcha. So like, what do we want? Is this how we want to do it? I, just to again, share a suggestion. I think it's a little early to decide anything. I would just suggest kind of capturing the feedback at this point. Okay, cool. All right. Thank you for helping me wrap my brain around all this. Sure. Um, um, okay. So I, I had one more thing to quickly add, because on the list you have in front of you, um, mm -hmm. I provide, I mentioned this at the last meeting when we were asked for needs assessment input, but under the expand evidence-based treatment options, mm -hmm. I, I want to be clear that we're at least keeping in mind the discrimination that's happening at a massive scale at pharmacies who are not filling um, buprenorphine prescriptions, suboxone prescriptions for people. Um, and that's it, it's, it continues. So try to go to a Kroger and CVS and see if they'll fill it. They probably won't. So um, just for example, not trying to single okay. them out. So I think we need to keep that squarely here because no matter how good our um, MAT, MOUD, whatever we're talking about is, if we can't get the people the, the treatment, then it doesn't matter. Okay. And in that case, the medication is the treatment or, or part of it. Right, right, is, yeah, part of their treatment. Okay, so we can add that under that number four as, as part of, yes, as part of that. And uh, I will say the department is doing education on that. Dr. Mm -hmm. Wes Gemmon um, is, is doing workshops and um, other um, efforts with pharmacists around the state. Um, there's limited authority because there's, they're not over the board of pharmacy, uh, but right. uh, again, maybe there's some other tools that they could potentially be given um, to, uh, to help and, and do more and get people move further along. Sorry. Thanks. Okay. All right. So just, um, you know, looking at the time, I would like to kind of wrap up the substance abuse and look at the mental health um, priorities. So do we have any additional comments that we want to add under the umbrella of substance use needs? Uh, I'll just say make I just again looking just the MOUD might we might want to specifically be looking at the EDs as a place to potentially put that the emergency departments um, mm -hmm. or otherwise just we're trying to get we want people to be able to get it right away when they need it that's really important. And I have um, to win. Um, okay so you're talking about like that first bullet under four. Sure just it or, might be good to mention that as an idea to yeah. prioritize it at the ideas that the EDs and we can we can create a need that kind of captures a few different things we want in one without getting too broad. Gotcha. Hi folks, this is Dia Cirillo with the mayor's office um, of uh, John Cooper in Nashville and I, I do apologize. I've, I've had to navigate a last minute surprise so I didn't get to benefit from the good discussion that I know Elliot has been leading on this. Um, I just wanted to raise an issue around detection um, of um, substance use um, uh, in um, mental health in the mental health care continuum, whether it's the crisis continuum um, or you know outpatient treatment um, or the forensic uh, treatment program. Um, and this might be better in the mental health section, but I think there's a real question about um, sort of emerging use of P2P math. And, I, and, and about how are we um, detecting uh, substance use um, and if there's an 
opportunity to detect the kind of substance that is being used. Um, so I just want to raise that maybe a good segue into um, the mental health portion of this discussion. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a, a great segue. Um, so we're, what you're talking about is um, like, say if somebody is experiencing a mental health crisis, the crisis team is responding. How are we detecting for substance use? Yes. And so specifically, um, you know, as we look at um, individuals who are charged, I mean, we're in Davidson County, we're looking very carefully at individuals who are charged with misdemeanors mm -hmm. um, yeah. and who have been deemed incompetent. Yes. Um, that's a high acuity population. Um, and 75% of that population has a dual diagnosis of substance mm. use of addiction. And so, um, you know, I think that the question there is, um, you know, what are some opportunities to introduce um, detection of that substance and uh, identification of that substance? Hi, Dia, this is Robin. I'll, I'll speak a little to that and going beyond just the identification piece. And I know with this particular um, population, the other thing that is really vitally important um, is the fact that we have wraparound services for these guys. Um, yeah. It's one thing to detect them when they come in, to determine what's going on with them. Uh, but these folks that need a uh, little more intensity, these are might be our, our, our people that, you know, come through the door um, again and again. And part of the reason they're coming through the door again and again is because they are not, you know, they're, they're being treated and released, treated and released, and they're not mm -hmm. getting the intensive wraparound services that are needed. This is stuff that we have discussed on the mayor's council. Um, you know, this is stuff that we have discussed in um, co-responder models. Yeah. And um, when we discuss these models, we have to admit there are, there is a percentage, a smaller percentage of people that intensively use and need the services. But if we get the use and the needs um, met, I don't think they'll, uh, some of them will ever, you know, not need, um, you know, not be in that revolving door. But I think it would help for some of them. Yeah, and it would definitely decrease that for sure. Yeah. And so, so I want to kind of bring this up because since we've got every, you know, this is a full council and not just adults, but and since we do have people that are familiar with what, other um, kind of research and projects are happening um, with this population of individuals who go through the misdemeanor evaluation process are deemed incompetent. What is happening to them? Um, how many are getting, um, who are being assessed and then being um, sent to involuntary hospitalization uh, versus how many are not? When I, like, as I was typing up um, our list of, of priorities that we identified on the mental health side and kind of looking at similarities in some of these and where they kind of overlap, there's a lot of overlap also with this population and efforts that are being started to really figure out like basically like, what, what, what are we doing wrong? Because the intent for the misdemeanor eval process was not to increase these individuals uh, re-arrest rate, um, but we've kind of seen that that's happening. And I know that there is, um, there has been, um, there's a group that is wanting to pursue getting additional funding to kind of do something, like create some type of wraparound project that's very in the pretty early stages. So when we look at our the, some of these priorities on the mental health side, um, I just, I guess I want to be sure that we are not trying to go after, like trying to get basically duplicating efforts, I guess, simple, simplest way to say it. Like if, is, is this an issue that we need to take under the, the regional council? Is this something that we need to let the group who's already working on it, let them do it and us kind of, um, filter out any of these priorities that would actually go along with that. What, what do you guys think about this? Like, and, and especially those who have been involved in um, like the other side working with, 
with uh, this population. So because a lot of it's just, housing, it's wrapped around, it's case management, it's right. doesn't, like it's all of those things are what's missing kind of. Right. If I may just jump in here and just clarify very specifically the area that we're sort of interested in seeing the department take a look at is sort of twofold. One is that certainly this population of um, individuals who've been charged with misdemeanors and deemed incompetent are a high acuity population typically. Um, and that's borne out in the Vanderbilt study. Mm -hmm. um, apparently in 2009, there was a policy change whereby only um, individuals who were charged with felonies and mm -hmm. who were deemed incompetent would be eligible for a further eval, a, a 30 day further psych eval. Yes. Um, so that is not available to this population. And so I think there's real interest in seeing parity for both mm -hmm. of these populations so that there's mm -hmm. coverage with that 30 day further eval. Yeah. Um, so that's one very specific policy piece, particularly considering that that 30 day further eval is considered the first step in treatment and stabilization for a high acuity population. Um, the other piece of that is the fact that um, our understanding is that MTMHI has about a 60 day wait. So for example, in Davidson County, if we have about 182 individuals who sort of fall into this camp of individuals deemed um, incompetent with misdemeanor charges, those individuals will never get to MTMHI in any significant time frame. Mm -hmm. um, and will you know persist in jail fundamentally until they get to MTMHI. And so I think the other policy piece is are there is there flexibility um, around that 30 day further eval? So I think there's a two step process here. One is can there be parity among the populations, whether it's a felony or a misdemeanor charge, that they would all be eligible for the 30 day further eval. And then the second issue is given, you know, the fact that COVID protocol is still in place mm -hmm. um, and that there's a 60 day wait, are there alternate um, providers uh, that could support the 30 day further eval? So those are two pieces, very specific. I'm not talking about wraparound. Um, and then the, the point I made about detection is, I think there's a growing interest to understand um, the utilization of P2P meth and the degree to, for which that can be tested. Um, you know, so um, that that's really that point. It was not about um, <clears throat> obviously wraparound services. We right. agree those are needed. Nobody is in argument about that, but I just wanted to clarify those points. Thank you very much. Thank you. And so um, just to kind of piggyback, when we're talking about admission to MTMHI, for the for anyone on the council who might not be as familiar with this process, we're talking about um, the weight for a forensic bit at MTMHI, which is very different than the weight for someone who um, meets the criteria for uh, being committed under the 6404. So there is it, it is a different process, and there is a very significant wait time for those forensic bids at middle. Um, and I do have a question because you said it and it was said earlier. When you say P2P meth, what do you mean by that? Um, that's a good question. I mean, um, Sam Quinones' new book really speaks to that and he had an article in The Atlantic, um, but it's, it's, you know, it's very hard for us to determine if that is currently very much in our marketplace. We're all trying to figure that out right now. Um, what but is it's, different? It's considered the new meth. Okay. Um, it's it's cheaper and it's it's leading yeah. to problems faster for people. Um, yeah. And so it's it's similar in effect, but it's it's a little different. And so yes, it it's primarily re yeah. recognized faster. It primarily triggers um, drug induced psychosis, and uh, then during the recovery period, it takes individuals much longer to recover mm -hmm. um, any basic socialization skills and individuals it appears are left with chronic um, persistent mental health conditions. Gotcha. Um, 
And so uh, detection is really critical. Thank you, Haley. Haley just posted the article oh, on the thank Atlantic. You. Yeah. So, so, so that's this, why the detection okay. piece is really important here. So we're, we're, we're trying to find out, like, is this something that we're seeing versus the, I guess, traditional myth? Yeah. Okay. That's exactly Sarah, I think I can answer a little bit of that for you. It is here. Not too many individuals are doing it, mm -hmm. but uh, it is on the streets of Nashville. Um, it is in Madison. Mm -hmm. And uh, because it is cheaper, we do have individuals doing it and the symptoms of it are totally different. Even when uh, some of it is mixed with fentanyl and the P2P and meth together. Mm -hmm. So the high advantages of overdose is astronomical. Gotcha. And when you look at the mental health, when we have at least 30 to 40 individuals given one way bus tickets to Nashville. Yes. And told that they will take care of you. Uh, you'll get everything free. Yeah. From other cities. It's yeah. making other it states. very, very hard for hospitals because some people do not give the correct information. So mm -hmm. thereby they are in and out of hospitals like revolving doors. Yeah. Because when you're putting in the data, you're putting the hospitals are putting in one thing that they're given. If they don't know or uh -huh. have are not given the information to say, okay, this is not the correct information on this individual, then thereby they can't track them. I've been in hospitals for there like 23 co-occurring mental cases. Mm -hmm. They're in hallways and everything's because they are running out of room. They're running yeah. out of everything. And it is getting very dangerous for hospital workers and first line workers. So our police officers, they, those that have had the crisis training are being pulled in numerous ways and they can't respond to a lot of calls that said uh, suicidal temp or abnormal mm -hmm. behavior. Mm -hmm. So it's first responders, fire department, we have certain policies and procedures and they have to stand there because they don't mm -hmm. know if the person is violent or not. They don't know if they have a weapon. Right, right. They can't, yeah. They can't really yeah. approach. They don't know if it's safe. right. But to give the hospitals their due, they can't give any information because half the time they don't have the information to give. Uh -huh. So um, having someone, the form of having someone in the ED, then even that person needs to know some trauma. Yeah. Because if they don't know trauma, then they themselves can be traumatized. Right. If that helps. Yes, it helps a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just I heard that term and I was like, mm, I don't know what that means. Um, and I, I mean, yeah, we've we've got it in the state for sure. I, I, my guess is we just haven't we we haven't known that we're looking at something different. Um, okay. One way to, to understand your drug supply is to, to use mass spectrometry. Um, and this is common in other states in syringe um, exchange programs and such. So uh, the harm reduction side on the SUD, that's another possible way to look at it. Um, we're starting with the uh, decriminalizing the fentanyl test strips, but that would be another area. So there's, there's ways that we can use funding to do that, but right now it's very hard to do that legally um, in most contexts. Yeah.
I think this also underscores the, ha the need for housing for people, especially coming out of um, the hospital, the psychiatric hospital um, when they're discharged. Uh, I, I know that a great number of people are going right back to downtown, to rescue mm -hmm. mission, to homeless encampment, wherever it may be. Um, this is not saying everybody does, but a lot of folks. Lot. And, uh, and and we need, they need to sleep somehow. Um, and sometimes others find other ways to cope. So if we can get them into stable housing and supportive services that can often preempt some of this um, being exposed to other substances on the street. So uh, that is certainly something we need to, to underscore. There's a huge need here. Yeah. I agree. And I thought when I was looking through the, the three year um, plan, I thought I saw somewhere where there was a um, a goal identified regarding um, the discharge from RMHIs. But then when I went back to look for it, I couldn't find it again. But that is um, I know that's I agree. Um, some of it is just lack of coordination. And unfortunately, some of it is the individual's lack of interest but um this is robin sheriff i could speak to that individual lack of interest i think we expect too much of people coming out of an right. RMHI. you know these are people you know if somebody had a heart attack we wouldn't expect them to immediately get back to their life and um somebody from the hospital be checking up on them to make sure they had their medication and other supports that they needed whereas yeah. you know, well, when they're, they're coming out of here and and, and their brains you know, their yeah. brains have, they've had a brain attack is what I like yeah. to say. Yeah. And and so um, I, it's other things that we have in the needs assessment, because this gets, this speaks to what we're talking about is only 50% of the people coming out of uh, a hospitalization from um, one of the mental health institutions, only 50% of them are getting to that first appointment after mm -hmm. hospitalization. Yeah. And there's very little follow up with those individuals um, proactively. They're expected to follow up and they're not in shape to do that a lot of times. Um, the other thing that we see is uh, it's great to get them in housing, but if you put them in independent living, we have a, a great lack of supportive, how to, supportive housing, especially mm -hmm. here in Davidson and especially in group homes. Um, uh, you know, we are doing the needs assessment for Region 4, and we have to acknowledge that um, the fact that uh, the the real estate market here has made it so appealing um, to some of our um, group home owners yeah. uh, that they've sold out in recent years. And, yeah. and we have, you know, a limited number of homes um, yeah. and, and the group well, homes especially. So, and, um, and also, I think across the county, looking at the, the various entities that do some type of discharge planning. So you've got the hospitals. Um, the EDs, the jails, it, there are, there's not a solid list of reputable housing providers. And I just found out last week that somebody, there's a group who usually stays on top of like who to refer to and who not. They've been placing people in to, with a housing provider who is absolutely just I, I have no words for how dishonest. Um, just I have not used this person in two years. Just the the level of dishonesty and um, I would I'd say abuse of you know vulnerable a vulnerable population, um, financial abuse. I I mean this when I found out that this group was still using this housing provider. I mean, I, I was livid because I couldn't believe like they didn't know, but that's what's happening in the hospital. I mean, they use providers that I've never heard of. And I don't know for anyone else, when I start looking at our mental health side of this, like it all kind of circles and connects together. We've got the need for um, like number 10, we've got peer recovery services following hospitalization. I'd love to, you know, the, the idea of that we have the, the peer support embedded in the hospital, you know, to increase utilization of that resource so that post hospitalization, there's additional, there's continued follow up. The housing piece that, you know, safe, affordable, um, supportive housing, um, 
you know, where where the support is in place through the housing provider. And then um, you making sure they're getting to their appointments, they have access to the outpatient treatment that they need. It just, there's so many of these that just really connect um, together for me. Sure, that used to be case management too. I know. I, I mean, know. And, and when the legislature dismantled case man, level two case management, a lot of these people. Um, that, I, I I noticed that Verenica has got her hand up. Oh, um, thank you. Oh, no, I was just gonna share. Um, I've you know I've I have found it interesting um, the challenges that we've seen in terms of housing. Um, we're having a difficult time with. Um, with um, finding people to support in our residential services, um, and Shara, you've seen you've seen our yeah. residents, you've seen the oh, residents. Yeah. Um, but even with several referrals, um, they, you know, the follow through is not there, and I'm, I'm starting to, you know, in trying to figure out what changes we need to make, or you know, where where can we improve in in terms of our pitch? It's I, I don't know. I'm I'm starting to wonder. Did we is the is the home too nice? Is it is that not what people are used to? And is there some fear there around um, actually being able to to reside in um, high quality housing? You know, because the narrative for so long has been kind of what you described, um, mm -hmm. Shara, in terms of housing. Yep. So yep. we've we've had several referrals, but um, they decide to go somewhere else. And then when I, you know, just kind of connecting with the case manager or whoever hearing about where they went, it, it's, it's very interesting. It's, it's puzzling. Hmm. You know, if I can jump in right there, this is Patrick. Hey, everyone. I've been listening for quite a while, but hadn't been able to talk, but uh, you guys are right on it. You know, that continuum of care from the jail to the group home or to support living from the hospital to the group home support living, there's a piece that's missing in that continuum of care, that peer support, even though the case manager, case management part has been um, um, not included um, for, the left, for the for the more part, but we still need to connect that connectivity for those group homes that are really, really out here trying to make sure that individuals have all the services that they need to be successful. And I like what Robert said a minute ago, you know, it's kind of like doing a disservice to individuals when you put them out there in the community coming out of the hospital. They've got some of them have court, some of them mm -hmm. have doctor's appointment, some of them have been, you know, given the responsibility of picking up medication. And there's just so much that's put on that individual just the, the trans, um, I guess, from the hospital to the group home, from the jail to the group home is so much put on the individual. So it's 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 more of a, like she said 50 percent. I was very surprised to hear that number. But it's so much put on the individual that they just give up. They just said, OK, well, I don't care. And it's a vicious cycle. It continues yeah. to go on and on. I'm I'm boots on the ground, people. And some of you know that. I see it every day, every single seven days a week, 24-7 there is a need for that gap to be closed or we're going to continue to talk about the same issue next mm -hmm. year, the year after and the year after. So I'm, I love what I'm hearing. At least we're talking about it. At least the ball is rolling and have not just fallen to the ground and overlooked some of the support that, um, that, that we're talking about. Yeah. So I want to, um, while, since we're on this topic, um, and I'm, you know, I know the Creating Homes Initiative is great. And I know we have been able to, um, you know, get some get some homes open, get some recovery programs expanded. Um, but when I look at, on paper, what it says, Creating Homes Initiative is supposed to um, help with. So this is taken from the three-year plan. So provide long-term financial support to housing facilities who serve as individuals with mental illness. And then in parentheses, community support housing in terms of long-term, intensive long-term support, emerging, emerging adults and supportive living program. And so my question is, when I look at, we identified housing in three, at least three different spots here. Um, and I'm wondering, 
does the creative house, the creating homes initiative, are we still leaving people out of, of that um, opportunity for financial, additional financial support? So, you know, expanding recovery, housing for mental health with support and additional operational um, funding for operational expenses. So we're talking here about homes like um, Miranda Kay, like Patrick, who, you know, they've gone through the process of getting licensed. So they have standards set forth that they have to follow. Um, we've got the, wait a minute, seven is not housing. I think I included this because, you know, we're talking about some of these types of housing, like emerging adults and intensive long-term support. The idea is that there is um, additional wraparound for that person, additional support for that person. So, you know, are we missing that co component? Um, you know, we do have, we're seeing more and more people who are dually diagnosed with intellectual disabilities, but they're following, they're following on the mental health side. So they're coming through crisis. They're at the jail getting served by mental health and then um, uh, getting assistance through criminal justice liaisons. Um, they're not coming through on the did side. And so then we are trying to house them and they have a special set of needs that um, some of our homes just can't, you know, they're just not equipped to be able to, to serve those needs. Um, housing, huh? sorry. Yes, yeah, go ahead. ahead. I was just going to say that there is a, a relatively new program that started through DIDD called Tennessee Start Assessment and Stabilization Teams. It's um, pre-rest diversion and response and uh, specifically related to the DIDD population. Yeah. So they got a good amount of funding and that seems like a, uh, a collaboration partnership opportunity. I'll drop a link in the chat. Thank you. Yes, I knew that there was something in place. I'm I'm just um, hesitant and a little nervous to see how it's going to play out because we, you know, there's been several um, different times over the years where we've seen from the did side, there's like a new program where there's an increase of support available and then it just kind of falls to the wayside. And we end up, I know here with the crisis treatment center, you know, we'll have somebody here for a couple of weeks um, simply because they don't have placement and need a placement. Um, and that's not what, you know, crisis diversion services are really designed for. Um, so I guess, you know, when we talk about what is already in the plan and not want to duplicate it, this is in the plan. And on again, on paper, to me, it looks like we would be duplicating with some of these priorities. But in reality, we're not. We're talking about something different. Um, and I just, I kind of wanted to put that, like, what are you guys' thoughts about this? And when it comes to um, the needs assessment and having a need, a needs that is a need, one need that is um, tied to the housing issues that we are seeing. I would definitely say number five um, is, a, is a priority, uh, funding for operational expenses for housing mm -hmm. providers. Um, a lot of the funding um, that opportunities that come out now are around infrastructure development, uh, cost, um, you know, cost reimbursement funding. Mm -hmm. um, but then housing providers are trying to support people who are in the situations that you all have just described. And so if we're wanting to kind of remove the burden from them, and support the, you know, have wraparound services and support these folks and with um, job placement skills and all of those things, then um, that funding has to come somewhere. Yeah. It has to come from somewhere. And so, um, you know, having those operational expenses um, provided will help the provider to support the residents and the people in with, with those wraparound services. And I, I think that, that that I don't know how long that's been on the three-year plan, but um, I know that uh, I'm pretty sure, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but that that has been um, an ask from housing providers for a, a quite a while. Yeah, I would I would say it's it's been it has definitely been the topic. I've been with Co-op for nine years, and pretty much all of the nine years, there's been a cry for help when it comes to 
you know, this this group of housing providers that um, they're not contracted with TenCare. Um, they're one, you know, they're not wanting to just have to house TenCare consumers. You know, we have individuals who are possibly able to work part time. Um, you know, maybe they have uh, disability benefits, but they have Medicare and they don't have TenCare and they're not getting anything additional, um, but expected to provide more support than um, just a rooming house. And that, yeah, that's kind of the boat that we're in. We believe in quality housing for, mm -hmm. um, should be available for anyone. And so we've, we've you know, built the infrastructure, we've created a, a quality home. And so, um, you know, the funding support is, is not there to be able to provide uh, quality services, you know? Um, yeah. And to kind of go back to what was mentioned earlier, there's there is no level two case management anymore, which would have at least alleviated some of the pressure that is now being placed on housing providers in regards to things like transporting to appointments, picking up medications, those kind of things. And and I I'll just add I, I learned just this week that Ten Care is. In their budget proposal, part of the reductions is because they're planning to no longer authorize payments to providers for um, Tennessee HealthLink, I believe, um, when they're in the care coordination and integrated care program. If they need a higher level of care, such as intensive case management, CTT, or intensive in-home treatment um, for uh, children and families. So um, oh. I, I see I've, this has been a constant battle for many years. Um, they long ago they used to authorize both case management and intensive in-home services that stopped mm -hmm. quickly. But care coordination is a is a uniquely different service the way that Ten Care has designed it. Um, and it was not the legislature; it was Ten Care that made that change. Um, yeah. And uh, and so anyway, there's a, there's that's about to be a change for the coming year to make it even tougher to help folks with the most complex issues who have Ten Care. So just wanted to right. put that on people's radar. Elliot, is that just on the children and youth side, or is that also for adults getting? Both, as far as I'm aware. Oh God. CTT for adults and both CTT yeah. and CCFT for children, but uh, details are scarce again. It's but that's what right. I'm hearing. Oof. Okay. Um, all right. It's almost one, so I'm going to stop sharing because we need to um, look at wrapping up. <laughs> Honestly, um, I do appreciate everybody's feedback and um, and thoughts on, you know, what we've talked about as far as what we're seeing in the area, um, the needs. Uh, I'm catching up on the chat. Sorry, I couldn't see any of this. What well, can I quickly just say while you're doing that two things? Mm -hmm. Is that OK, Cheryl? Uh, yes. OK, one, um, just like I mentioned, um, SUD related deflection earlier on that side. I think we we need money um, from the state or passed down through federal grants for um, more to expand and continue and grow co-response efforts. So such as what was being done in Nashville and uh, especially also to um, grow and we'll start and grow community responder programs such as the Nashville Heals program that's been proposed for our city. Um, that is extremely important. And then lastly, it's something that maybe at a later date our group can discuss more in depth, but I think there's it, we've come to a time that we really need to explore um, evidence based voluntary options to inpatient alternatives to inpatient care. Um, we can't take care of everybody in inpatient. We have too long of waits and there are models such as Soteria House um, developed long ago in the United States, but rarely used um, and uh, open dialogue, which is actually developed in Finland, which has shown a lot of success to where people with um, other what who would otherwise go to an inpatient facility are able to be taken care of in other supportive environments. Um, mm -hmm. It costs less money and leads to better outcomes and can reduce some strain on the system. So I think we're at a time we really need to start looking at those. I agree, and I don't know if California still does this, but at one point um, several years back, um, California had a program and it was through the forensic process, but instead of um, instead of just having the either or the hospitalization versus community placement and like a, a group home, there was an in between. Um, it, so it was kind of an MOT, but not really MOT with wraparound where the individuals would stay in this. It's a residential setting with all the support services. And as long as they 
you know, stay com- compliant with their treatment and, and did well, they were fine. If they started to refuse meds, that kind of thing, then they could go back to the hospital if needed. But, you know, well, there, there are definitely some other options. A lot of people don't go seek care because they have had bad experiences with meds or don't want them. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so, and there's certainly a lot of, pe- it's been proven that people can recover and do well sometimes without meds or with lower doses. So we just don't really have options. We have one route, it seems, and we need to come up with options because everybody's different. Yes, agreed. And I want to thank Elliot for that. I, I really do. And and we want to empower people as much as possible to um, to be able to make their choices. I know it's not always easy on the caregivers and I know it's not always easy on the system, but um, but if, if, if we can, um, you know, engage and, and, you know, let people be a part of their treatment, although I know there are times, we certainly see it too, where um, it, when somebody's in the deepest part of their crisis that, um, that they're gonna need some some help because they're just, um, really bad, but if but if you have people in recovery and um, they need to be able to test against what works for them and what they can do um, for their for their wellness um, and to be supportive. I'm sorry, I had to take a call, so I missed some of the last conversation um, that you guys were engaged in. But um, um, I'm here for the last four minutes, and then I go on to a one o'clock call. Yes. Um, so wrapping up. Um, we have our next meeting is going to be February 2nd, 2022. Um, that will be the only other meeting we have as a full council to um, get our needs assessments worked through. Um, and as soon as we get the adult committee meeting scheduled, um, we'll get that sent out. Um, Kirby, Angie. Robin, Elliot, anybody? Rusty, am I? Uh, just a, <laughs> one one thing you could consider if anybody on the adult committee has any of the particular needs that uh, I think if there's some consensus building, maybe fill out um, a needs assessment worksheet or two on those, or at least draft, you know, put some bullets in there so that we can kind of get the head start and then present and those can be presented hopefully to um, the group at the next time. But and then we'll select those. But uh, also, I think. If we can kind of send a list with all of these ideas and kind of as organized as possible to uh, everybody, that yeah. might help for thinking in between and um, some conversations might occur. Yeah. I, yeah, I would like to say I would like to see the adult committee just as a member of that committee meet in January sometime mm-hmm. uh, or, or uh, yeah, January because the meeting will be the first Wednesday in February. Um, yeah, Robin, that's yeah. kind of where I was about to land. If I didn't get too much more feedback, I was just going to. Um, get with Evelyn and and have a decision made. So, yeah, yeah. I, I would like to see us do that for adult committee, and maybe maybe we could encourage children's committee to do the same thing. And then I think maybe what we do in those committees will help feed the um, some specifics into the full council. Yeah, I think the adult committee does already have their next meeting scheduled. Am I right, Susan? Are you still on? If you're asked about the children's committee. I meant the children, I'm sorry. We do have our next uh, date scheduled and it's uh, January the 25th at 10 a.m. Awesome. I'd just like to say if people have not participated on one of these committees on the adult mental health or substance use committees and want to do that, I really encourage them to come to the meeting. Uh, I think we had a good starting point for jumping off today for the conversation, but there have been so many ideas generated here today. It's going to be important that everybody be um, there with their viewpoints and represent. So we really do have a solid uh, ask to send up that everybody can be uh, in agreement on. This is Susan again. If you would share the needs uh, assessment list that you have, the Children's Committee will look at that on the uh, 25th. Yes. Uh, since we're new in starting this, um, maybe we can have some more suggestions for you. Yes. And I know, I know during the meeting, I, or I think during the meeting, I sent the link um, to the meets assessment, but I don't mind just going ahead, the, the one from last year. I don't mind going ahead and just attaching that as well um, so that you've got it on hand to compare 
with some of the um, ideas that are being discussed for this year. That would be very helpful for us. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, do we have anything else that needs to be talked about, addressed, announced um, before we adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting. I'll second. So is that Robin, were you the second? Yep. Okay, awesome. Bye guys. Bye. Thank you. Kirby, Bye, Avis, everybody. Do we Thank need anything else? Have a great day. Nope, we're good. Thanks all. Uh, all right. Bye. Thanks, everybody.